for Halox Sol. I am Skeggy Vetter, and welcome to the Norse Code. In this episode, we are going to talk about Tom Hiddleston. Wait, that's not right. Loki. We are going to talk about Loki. Not Marvel's Loki, but the Norse god of mischief, Loki. So, let's start off with who is Loki. Keep in mind, the Norse Loki is very different than the Marvel Loki. There's a few things they, they got right, but not much. To begin with, Loki is the trickster god. The god of chaos. The god of mischief. The fire god. And a shapeshifter. In fact, he's the shapeshifter. I mean, there are other gods who can change form and disguise themselves, but Loki is really known for shapeshifting. He is the son of Farbauti, who is a Jotun, and Laufi, who is assumed to be a Jotun, but it's not expressly said. Uh, th this is one thing that Marvel almost got right. They have Loki being Laufey's son, Loki Laufey's son. But Laufey is Loki's mother, not his father. Loki is the husband of Sigyn. And with Sigyn, he fathered two children, Narfi and Nari. With a Jotun witch, Angraboda, he fathered three children, Hel, Fenrir, Jormungandr, and with a horse he mothered Shlepnir. That's right, Odin's eight-legged horse is the offspring of Loki, and Loki's the mother. You might be asking yourself how that happened? Well, that's going to be the first story we talk about in a couple minutes. Loki resides in Asgard with Odin, and Loki and Odin are Oath Brothers, or Blood Brothers. Uh, the translation could go either way. In Marvel, Loki is the adopted brother of Thor, but in the Norse mythology, he is the um, chosen brother of Odin. That's right, Odin chose Loki to be his brother and took a vow uh, he even took an, swore an oath that he would never accept a drink unless Loki was offered one as well. Loki is very often the savior of the gods. But usually he's the one who put the gods in the bad situation to begin with. So, you know, he's kind of got that dichotomy to him. He screws things up and then makes things better. It, it's just who he is. Now, Loki shows up in the vast majority of stories from the Norse times. And to go through all of Loki's stories, we'd be here all night. And a lot of them really deserve their own episode to kind of delve in a little bit deeper. So, instead, I've chosen three big stories from Loki's um, Loki's life, all leading up to Ragnarok, as everything seems to, and Loki will just pop up over and over and over again as we continue to go through the stories from Norse mythology. So the first story that we're going to talk about tonight is the birth of Sleipnir. As I said, Loki is Sleipnir's mother. So, once upon a time, a Jotun came to Asgard and offered to build an impenetrable wall around the realm to protect it from any enemies. Which, of course, the gods were happy to accept. So they asked, what does the Jotun want as payment? He goes, oh, it's simple. All I want is Freya's hand in marriage, and the sun, and the moon. So. He's asking for an awful lot. So the gods meet to discuss, 
and Loki offers up a solution. We accept his cost, but we tell him it's only good if he can finish the job in a single season, which I believe was winter. So, and oh, yeah, and he's not allowed to have any help outside of his horse. So, the gods present this counter offer to the Yeoman, and the Yeoman accepts. Now, here's the thing about his horse. Svadalfari. Svad... Svadalfari. Difficult name to pronounce. He was a magnificent horse. He was incredibly strong, didn't need to sleep, and could outwork just about any other creature within the realms. With his help, the Jotun was able to build a wall. And in fact, with only a day or two left before the end of the season, he was nearly finished. All he had left was the final gate. So the gods, furious that Loki's plan backfired, threatened Loki, basically telling him, we're not giving up the sun and the moon, we're not giving up Freya, you better fix this. So Loki, being the very clever god that he is, says, all right, I can handle this. So that night, when Svatolfari goes out into the woods to find some more stones to finish the wall, as he did every night, he met Loki. Except Loki was in the form of a mare. And for those of you who don't know, a mare is a female horse. So Loki takes off running, and Svatolfari, Svatolfari, God, that's hard to say, pursues Loki throughout the night and into the next day. So without the help of the horse, the Jotun is unable to complete the, the wall on schedule, and, does, and thus does not get Freya's hand, the sun or the moon. Now, Svadolfari does in fact catch Loki and impregnates Loki. And Loki gave birth to an eight-legged horse, Schlepnir. So Odin's lake eight-legged horse, the horse that can run faster than any other creature in the realms, the one of the few if any other creatures that can head into hell and come back out on his own free will was mothered by Loki. Sired by Loki? What's the right word for that? Anyway, Loki's his mother. <clears throat> Which is an odd story. <laughs> so, the next story which is a huge, huge story for uh, Norse mythology, is the kidnapping of Eden. Now, Odin, Loki, and Honir were on a journey through Jotunheim, and they were running low on food. So they came across an ox, slaughtered it, and began to cook it for dinner. Except the meat wouldn't cook. No matter what they did, the meat would not cook. And I'm going to go on a little side tangent here. Um, nowadays, if you see an ox, it belongs to somebody. Once upon a time, you can find wild oxen in Europe. Uh, they went extinct some, I think, 1,000, 2,000 years ago, something like that. I don't remember. But... Yeah, at one point, a wild ox was something that you could come across. So, back to the story. So they're trying to cook this ox, and the meat, it just, it just won't cook. So they find an eagle sitting in the tree above them. The eagle says to them that it is his magic that is stopping the meat from cooking. And that if they will grant him a simple request, he will take the curse off the meat, and allow the meat to cook so the gods can eat. And all the eagle wanted was some of the meat for himself. So, 
one ox is more than enough food. So the gods accept. And the eagle comes down and starts taking all of the choice cuts of meat, all the best pieces. And Loki thought this was a little too much. So he decides the eagle has had enough, grabs a branch and swings it at the eagle. The eagle, being a magical talking eagle, surprise, surprise, caught the stick and starts to fly away with it as Loki is still holding on. So this eagle kidnaps Loki, takes him away. And it turns out the eagle was not an eagle at all. In fact, it was a Jotun, Thiazi. Thiazi is the father of the goddess Skadi. So, Thiazi tells Loki, I will let you go. But, first you need to swear an oath to me that you will kidnap Eden and her fruit and bring it to me. Now, a couple side things here. First, Eden is a goddess, an Aesir, and she tended the fruit that kept the gods young. Uh, it is often portrayed as an apple. However, the, the Scandinavian people would not have seen an apple until well within the uh, Viking Age when they started exploring into the Mediterranean and that. And the story predates that time. So it was unlikely that's actually an apple. It could just, and it's usually tra just translated as fruit. So it really could be just about anything. Um, it's, it, this kind of lines up with the um, ambrosia of the gods in Greek and Roman mythology. Also the oath. You know, I, I said before that Odin took an oath to be a blood brother of Loki and that he wouldn't drink unless Loki's offered a drink as well. And here you have another oath. The, the Norse people took oaths very, very seriously. If you made an oath, you were honor bound to hold it. And the gods felt the same way. If they take an oath, they're going to hold up their end of the bargain. So, Loki is released, he gets, comes back to Odin and, and Honir, and they head back to Asgard. And so, Loki goes and finds Eden, and takes her away to Thiazi. Now, without Eden, and without her fruit, the other gods begin to feel the effects of old age. Wrinkles, gray hair, you know, hearing loss, their knee starts to click and, and they can tell when the weather's going to change because their knee, their hip hurts. Not that I have any experience with those things. Not getting old at all. No. Uh, so they start looking for Eden. They can't find her. What they do find out is the last time she was seen, she was seen leaving Asgard with Loki. So they go after Loki and say, hey, what's going on? Where's Eden? And Loki, knowing full well that there's no getting out of this, tells them the whole story. So they say, all right, go get her. So Freya offers a feather from one of her hawks to Loki, which allows Loki to turn into a hawk. And he flies out to Thiermheim, which is Theazi's home and later the home of Skadi. He finds Idun alone, as Thiazi has gone out fishing, turns her into a nut, picks her up, and starts to fly back to Asgard. Thiazi comes back, finds Idun missing, starts looking around for her, and sees Loki leaving, flying away from Thermheim. So he turns back into an eagle and begins to chase. Now, as they get closer to Asgard, the eagle, the Azi, is catching up to Loki and Idun. They got to see this, and so they decide to build a giant pyre outside the city. Or outside the realm, I should say. As soon as Loki and Idun pass the pyre, they light it on fire, and it goes up in flames so quickly that the Azi is caught in the flames and is burnt to death. 
This is the catalyst for what brings Skavi to Asgard and eventually leads to her becoming a goddess. I'm not going to tell that part of the story. That's for next month, because next month we will be talking about Skadi. And those eagle-eyed viewers out there who are watching this on YouTube might see a couple of Skadi statues here behind me. So, as I said, we'll talk about the rest of that story next month. But this is the story that leads up to Skadi becoming a goddess. So this is a very big story. So the third story, which leads to Ragnarok, that I'm going to talk about tonight, is arguably the most important story in all of Norse mythology, outside of maybe the bull spot. This is the death of Baldr. Now, Baldr is the son of Odin and Frigga. He is the shining god. He is the god that everybody else loves. He is perfection incarnate. Uh, in fact, medieval Christians would often uh, portray Baldr as a Christ-like figure in their attempts to convert the pagan Norse into Christians. So, it was prophesied that the son of Odin, Baldr, his death would trigger Ragnarok. Not that Ragnarok would happen immediately after his death, but it would be the very first domino to tip that begins the train to Ragnarok. Now, of course, you can again make the argument that the first domino to tip was Odin finding out about Ragnarok because a lot of what he did to pre prevent it caused it. But we'll cover more of that as we cover more stories that lead to Ragnarok. So, in an attempt to save her son, Frigga goes around to all of the realms and makes everything swear an oath, swearing oaths again, that they will not harm Baldr. And we're not just talking about Jotuns and people and the Aesir, the Vanir, the Elves, the Dwarves. We're also talking about steel and rocks and pine and magma and water and air. Everything swears that it will not harm Baldr. Balder, which leads to a very obvious game amongst the gods. Throwing things at Balder and watching them not hurt him. So the gods would gather around and throw spears, shoot arrows, throw axes, put him in, in cages with dangerous animals, and watch them not hurt Balder. So Loki, being the god of mischief and seeing an opportunity for mischief, disguises himself, shapeshifter, once again, and goes to talk to Frigga about the oaths that were sworn. What he finds out is that everything, except for one thing, swore an oath not to harm Baldr. Or, yeah, not to harm Baldr. And that one thing is mistletoe. And it was just assumed that mistletoe was such a small, insignificant thing that it doesn't matter. It does. What can it really do? So Loki finds some mistletoe and fashions a spear from it. He then goes to the blind god Hoder and says, Hey, I know you don't get to play this game with all the other gods because you're blind, so I made you a spear. And, all, and I will help you aim it. And then you can throw something at Baldur too. So, Holder's excited to be able to play with the others, takes the spear, look, he helps him aim, throws the spear, and it kills Balder. This is not taken well by any of the gods. He, this is the shining god. This is, this is the god that everyone looks up to. And now he's dead. Now Ragnarok has officially started. So, Baldur's brother, Hermod, takes Schleppner and rides into Helheim, hoping to have an audience with Hel and persuade her to release 
Baldur, so that he may come back to Asgard. And part of his, you know, trying to convince Hel was that everybody loves Baldur. He is so incredibly missed that it, he can't be dead. So Hel agrees. Yes, I will release Baldur, but only if everything weeps for Baldur. So, Hormod goes back, tells everybody, goes through all the realms, and they all begin to weep for Baldur. All, except one. Seems like I've said that before. The one that did not weep for Baldur is the Jotun Tok. Tok was ice-hearted, didn't care that Baldur was dead, and would not weep for him. Some even think that Tok was in fact Loki in disguise. But we don't know that for sure. So, with Tok not weeping for Baldur, Hell won't release Baldur's soul. And so begins Ragnarok. Loki is a key character during Ragnarok. Not only did his trick against Baldur start the ball rolling, but he also fathered Hel, who brings an army of the dead against the Aesir, Fenrir, whose sons, Hathi and Skull, eat the sun and moon, Fenrir destroys everything and kills Odin, and Jormungandr, who poisons the air, poisons the sea, fights Thor, where they kill each other. And Loki's part of it, you know, his, his proper part of it, is when he breaks out of his imprisonment. Now, I didn't mention Loki being imprisoned yet, did I? You might think he was imprisoned for the death of Baldur, but he wasn't. Now, Loki crossed the line in what is one of my favorite stories of Norse mythology that I won't be covering tonight. <laughs> I want to do a uh, episode on this by itself because so much happens in that story it, it takes some talking about. So that'll be an episode in and of itself. But the highlight of it, Loki insults the wrong gods at the wrong time and, gets, and they're just fed up with him and he is punished. They've had enough. They're done with him. They're locking him up. So, they forge a chain from the entrails of Loki's own son, Narfi. He is tied to three rocks in a cave, and Skadi, the serpent hanger, hangs a serpent above Loki's head. And the venom drips from the, from the serpent's fangs onto his forehead, much like the Chinese water torture, except this isn't water. Venom. Now, Loki's wife, who is very devoted to Loki, Sigyn, holds a bowl above Loki's head to collect the venom to at least try to stop Loki's pain. When the bowl fills up with venom, she moves away to dump out the venom, and a few drops do fall on Loki's head. In, at which point he screams and writhes in agony. And his thrashing due to the pain is what causes earthquakes, according to Norse mythology. Sigyn will stand by Loki up till he escapes during Ragnarok. Loki will break free and lead the Jotuns into Asgard against them on his ship, Naglfar, which is made by the fingernails and the toenails of the dead. Which has got to be an interesting looking ship, for sure. So look, during Ragnarok, Loki will fight Heimdall, and they will kill each other. Which seems to be a common theme against Ragnarok, killing each other during the fight. So that's the mythology of Loki, at least as much as, as we're going to cover tonight. He's going to pop up again and again in all of the stories that 
that we're going to cover. You know, Thor going to, to Jotunheim and being tricked to becoming a bride. Interesting story. Loki's involved. Skadi becoming a goddess. We'll cover that next month. Loki's involved. My favorite story. Loki insulting everybody and getting imprisoned. That we'll cover probably sometime in the spring because it's just a fun story to talk about. But time and time again, Loki will pop up. So we can view this kind of as a, a introduction to Loki so that we're ready for him during the rest of our talks. Now, let's move on and talk about how Loki was worshipped during the Viking times. For a long time, it was assumed that Loki wasn't worshipped. There was no Loki cult. There was no worshipping of Loki at all. There, there's been no archaeological finds of any Loki worship in Scandinavia. However, recently, in the last year or two, there have been some finds in England that suggest that there was Loki worship. Not widespread, but small sects of Loki worshippers. You'll see here on the screen, there's a few stones with Loki carved into it. In fact, that top picture there is from an archaeological site that was found on an altar to Loki. It's also assumed, now there's no evidence to support this, but it is assumed that one of the reasons that we don't find evidence of Loki worship because it was all wiped out. You see, Loki so often is viewed as the bad guy. Whether that's deserved or not is up to interpretation. Um, but a lot of medieval Christians viewed Loki as a Satan-like figure. So worshipping Loki would equate to devil worship in their eyes and so they would just wipe that out entirely because they wanted to stop that. Now in modern times, Loki is very heavily worshipped. Partly because of the Marvel movies, but hey, anything that brings knowledge of the, the Norse is a good thing, in my opinion. So Loki worship needs to be taken cautiously because he will grant you great gifts, but at a price. A friend of mine went through something recently that lines up with, with what I'm talking about. Uh, he had his entire life destroyed in a year. Completely burnt down everything. His life is better now than it has ever been before, but he had to go through hell to get there. This is exactly what Loki does. He'll give you a gift, but you got to pay for it. Uh, a few examples that have happened to me recently. Uh, I was do giving a offering to the gods and I had a fire in front of me and I would make a toast to the gods and pour the drink into the fire. And for everyone, pour the drink, flames got a little higher, move on to the next god. As I said earlier, Odin swore that he would never accept the drink unless Loki was offered too. So, of course, I have to offer a drink to Loki if I want to offer one to Odin. Offer one to Loki, pour the drink, and the wind changes and blows the smoke right in my face. The wind was to my back before. Blows the smoke in my face and then goes right back to blowing to my back, blowing the smoke away from me. Which made, made me laugh because, like, well, I mean, ghost in the god of mischief. Here you go. Uh, most recently, today, I recorded this podcast, only to find out that I had this weird mark on my face that I didn't see in the viewfinder of the camera, and my audio wasn't turning on. So I had to come back up here and re-record it. I got 20 minutes into this episode, right before we talked about Ragnarok. Battery died in the camera, which I had previously turned, you know, charged prior to recording this the first time. And all this, while I'm talking about Loki and have done some prayers to Loki the other day, hope, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping this is all leading up to my gift, which is what I asked Loki for, which is that my snake gets returned to me. Yes, I have a snake. 
It is currently loose somewhere in my house and I can't find it. And I pray to Loki for help with that. So, if you're watching this, please, whoever you believe in, pray that my snake comes back out of hiding and I can put him back in his enclosure and take care of him because it's past feeding day and I'm sure he's hungry. So, how do you worship Loki? Well, obviously there's prayers. You know, you can find a lot of those online you know, and offerings. Um, alcohol is an, an obvious one for the, the Norse gods. You know, you could go with mead. I think tequila makes a lot of sense for Loki. Uh, bad whiskey is one that gets thrown around a lot. And it's kind of has that dichotomy of, you know, people love whiskey, but you get a bad one, so you get that, that good and bad together. Uh, Loki loves spicy foods, cinnamon, apples, uh, acts of service, fire, shadow work. Now, if you're unfamiliar with shadow work, shadow work, which has been adopted by neo-pagans uh, in these, these last few decades, actually starts off in psychiatry. It is looking within yourself, finding all of the bad within you, discovering the reasons why that's there, and using it to work for you instead of against you. It's a very painful thing to do, but you come out the end as a much better person, which kind of sounds like a Loki gift. Go through pain, get something better. You have to burn it down to build something better. So that's Loki in a nutshell. You know, like I said, we're going to cover a lot more of Loki as we continue this show. Uh, next month, we'll be talking about Skavi and you know, how she became a goddess, and Loki plays a big part in that, not just causing the death of Fiazi, she has other roles in that story, which are bizarre, to say the least. <laughs> but, well, thank you for taking this journey with me tonight on Loki. I hope this is a good starting point for all information on Loki. If there's anything else you'd like to know about Loki or any other gods or anything else you'd like me to cover, please leave a comment so that I know and you feel free to reach out to me. Like and subscribe us on YouTube. Follow The Norse Code on Facebook. Thank you for listening to me tonight. And until next time.